Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And this guest, man, I'm so excited for this. I've only had three other guests that are specifically skilled in this area. And it's been a while since I had them on the podcast. Um, Just to name a few that you're kind of in this uh, genre with. I actually forget the other guy's name. Why did I just forget it? Anyways, I know Dr. Benjamin Hardy. He's a stud. Um, really, really focused on this area, but the idea of positive psychology, but really like, how do we structure the right questions to get the desired outcome or achieve more happiness and fulfillment? So Aaron Markham, he's actually from Idaho, it's home state for me. I love it, except for he's from the terrible cold side of Idaho. Um, (laughs) I'm from the better side, which is less green, less mountainous, but warm seasons on your side. Yeah. 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 Not just ice sleet. I mean, there's four like ice snowstorms cold and then like was it three months maybe of nice weather yeah 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 three months of summer and summer even up there is still pretty cold if you're from arizona now where i reside so true a summer in idaho falls is not that great most of the time so uh so a little cold (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah anyways he's, he's founded several companies um, that has just been very successful studied um at university of pennsylvania and just really been become an expert in this area and now he's really working on a company called entre thrive helping entre- entrepreneurs if i'm not mistaken here yeah. really yeah. really launch now this book is going to be out in the next maybe week or two and you're going to want to ja- january 22nd actually yeah so a little a week yeah. or two yeah so, okay. that, so, continue, yeah. so you definitely want to get this on your radar you can go on amazon pre-order it you can probably go to his website which we'll talk about pre-order it i think anytime you're going to buy somebody's book i know you like amazon because it's just easier sometimes for you but amazon i know because i have a book on amazon they rape their people so don't do that go to the website donate to the person who actually wrote the book, and just buy it right off their website. It's better for you. It's better for them. It's better for everybody. And it's always worth it. Okay. So uh, yeah, just, just go to the website and plus you get to find out all the other things that they're doing and how they could help you in other ways. So Aaron, go ahead and introduce yourself as far as how did you get to where you are? Why are you where you are? What was the things in your life that spurred this growth in this direction? And why are you so passionate about passing that knowledge on to the the next level of entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, and thank you. It's, I'm, it's just ex- I'm excited to be on the show with you and, and and to have these conversations. My journey, you know, a lot of journeys like this start when we're young, right? In childhood, and I I grew up most of my teenage years. I grew up in Las Vegas, not in Idaho. We moved to Idaho later. I was actually born in Idaho, moved to Vegas, and I I recognize early on as a teenager that um, I had a busy mind, a lot of ideas, a lot of a lot of uh, I was very distracted even back then. This is before smartphones that might date me a little bit, but uh, but I had this kind of passion to to kind of do my own thing. I could entertain myself for hours. My my parents would just kind of put me in a corner and I would entertain myself and. I think I discovered in my late teens, you know, early twenties that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to do my own thing. And my first kind of venture, um, when I, you know, after I graduated from college, I uh, met my wife, you know, at college. And my first venture was working with seniors. We were in college. We worked with, uh, my wife had volunteered at an elder hostel, uh, kind of, um, program where where seniors would come in and spend the summer and she would take them around to places and so forth so i got to be around this older population who you know when you talk about legacy 
right? Is these are people, and usually on the wealthier side, they they were active. They had this legacy in mind, you know, even back then. And and so I started a home care agency a few years after we were married. And that was my first kind of um, jump into entrepreneurship. Fortunately, I guess with my drive and how I kind of got into being an entrepreneur is that was a successful venture in the end. Early on, extremely difficult. Went through a lot. Um, I found that, you know, and this also leads me to positive psychology is that early on in my journey as an entrepreneur, I was coming home, spending time with my family, had young kids at home, had three young kids at home, four young kids at home at the time, eating dinner, then going back to work until like one or two a.m. And I had this kind of obsessive passion, which in positive psychology is not super healthy. It's not harmonious passion. It's the obsessive passion where, where I was going all in on the professional side and thinking that my personal side would eventually catch up with itself. And I grew that company that way. It was grinding it out. And I was fortunate. I, I had a, a wonderful exit from that company. A public company came in and, and bought my company out a few years later. And then I started my second venture, which has been you know, that second venture. Uh, I exited. I fully exited in 2020 is extremely successful. Uh, it, it continues to be a successful venture, but early on in that journey, you, th- you would think that I would have learned what the grind felt like back, you know, in my first venture, and I started doing it again. I started getting into those obsessive passion and just kind of grinding it out again. And in that in that business, we hit a ceiling about 2015, 2016. We had some growth. I started that in 2008, 2009. And hit the ceiling and just kind of plateaued. And I also recognized at the time, this is a turning point for me, as I recognized that personally I had plateaued. That I that I had put so much into my professional side that I not only had I personally plateaued, I was going down. Like it wasn't just a plateau. So my business had plateaued, my personal life was suffering. And so I just had this turning point. And the the book that kind of helped me get kind of into positive psychology uh, was the happiness advantage. Sean Acor wrote that years ago. That was my first kind of exposure to positive psychology and, and, and the fact that I had to make some life changes. And so before, before we started recording, I mentioned that 200 mile bike race, Lota John. My first one was 2016. I recognized I needed to make a change. And this is a typical entrepreneur. So I, it was April of 2016. I wanted to get into biking. I had for a while. I just never had made the space for it. And so I ordered my road bike the same day that I registered for the 200 plus mile bike race that was only five months later. I mean, talk about like quick start, all in. And, uh, but, Honestly, that was one of the best things I could do is that I found another thing to be passionate about. And through that journey, I finished it successfully with my two buddies. And we, uh, you know, we, you know, our timing was terrible, you know, as far as how quickly we did it, but we did it before dark. And so through that experience, and, and if you look at like hockey stick growth in my entrepreneurial journey, it was 2016 when I started like. I I call it in my book, the lie of the either or is that entrepreneurs, they can get stuck in that lie that they, they feel like if I just put everything into my professional, that's the the lie of the either or that the either or is personal and professional flourishing. If I just flourish professionally and I thrive there, eventually my personal side will catch up with itself. And with that, you know, we've, we're just in this this lie that 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 really is is not true. That we can have both, and that often when I started really investing in my personal side, of flourishing, my health, my well being, my um, my presence, and and just being present with my team. That's also the year, ironically, that I became a better leader. If you talk to my leadership team at the time. I, I invested more in the business. That's also the year we found the, the EOS entrepreneurial operating system and started doing things in the business to make it better. 
and it just like that hockey stick growth. And then again, I, I read that book, Positive or The Happiness Advantage, led me to positive psychology, which is really the science of well being. Positive psychology isn't the science of how to be happy all the time. It's really the science of how do we flourish regardless of circumstances, regardless of challenges, but regardless of uncertainties. Because do entrepreneurs experience uncertainties all the time, right? We're always dealing with those things. And then, you know, fast forward, I, I exited that, that company in 2020. Um, I actually became an EOS implementer trying to help other uh, other businesses grow and expand, continue to invest in other companies um, as well. But then I, I went, to, I, I applied to the um, Master of Applied Positive Psychology program at UPenn, which is the number one program in the world. Martin Seligman founded that program, had a wonderful opportunity to, to be taught by him and by so many other amazing people that would come in. Uh, into that program and that program that to me it, everything i had done since 2016 kind of came to a full circle where i was like wow this is this is like next level for me and i started changing personally even more my daughters um even made the comment my kids have made the comment that when i was going through that program dad you're different Dad, you're more present. You're more, you know, and my wife, my mom even made that comment um, that you're just different. And that's usually, you know, the, the thing I would get. And then um, I went into that program, you know, with the with the whole goal of helping entrepreneurs because I had been that through that journey. I had burnout, uncertainties, challenges, um, obsessive passion, which is unhealthy, I believe, um, as an entrepreneur. I've been through all that and to have both the entrepreneurial background with the positive psychology background and marrying the two for me personally was magic. And I also want to share that magic, you know, with so many others. And that's kind of where I'm at today. And that's where the book is coming from. It's coming from my journey and how I got to into positive psychology, but it, you know, and then I share all this, all the, all the stories, not just the stories, but the actual, um, science as well and combine the two and I think it's uh you know my publisher calls it my opus you know it's really kind of kind of turned into that so that's awesome well I, yeah. I love it I want, yeah. I want I want to highlight a few things um like you mentioned something about being busy in your own mind and having the time to do that I think a lot of people don't ever allow themselves to be busy in their own mind, to have enough downtime to shut off the overworking side of their mind and be that just busy person and say, oh, I, what do I actually want? Well, how would I entertain myself? What would I do with my time? Can you go a day without your cell phone? And I, I know that sounds crazy, but it, in, the, you know, in the Jewish cultures and there's other cultures, they go a whole day, almost always 24 hours, once a week, d depending on like how religious you are. But you know, without any technology. And what's the value of that? And a lot of people think, well, wow, I don't want to restrict myself that way. Um, I was talking to another friend of mine. They were talking about like, do, why do we have to keep the God's, God's commandments? Or if we keep God, God's commandments, are we any better off? And it's like, we don't have to keep God's commandments. We're not going to be, have any different perspective. Uh, God's not going to love us any more or less if we keep his commandments or not. He's not going to do anything more for us or less for us if we keep his commandments or not. The, the goal of living your life as God would have, live his life is so that you can be and have what he has. That's the, that's the goal of it. If you don't want to be or have what he has, then don't live your life that way, right? But the idea of keeping, what is keeping? And sometimes people think keeping is a, like a command type thing. Keep the commandments. Um, and keep has a lot of different meanings. Uh, in fact, I'm going to see if I can find the, the definition here that I'm, I'm thinking of, but like a well-kempt person, kempt is like a, a past tense of keep, but it's about, are you keeping it in order? Just like obeying, obeying has nothing to do with a command, but an honoring. Obeyance is I'm, I'm choosing to do this because I honor, I'm excited for what that is. And uh, keep is like a safeguard. So when they're saying keep my commandments, it's not saying 
keep as in perform my commandments. He's not saying that. Keep is actually a, a like a, a feeling verb. It's like respect and honor and hold in reverence this invitation. And a lot of people don't fully comprehend that. And so they're stuck on that. Well, we have to do this. You don't have to do anything. And I think when I read, uh, I don't know which book it was, could have been the happiness advantage, but there's a lot of this stuff in positive psychology. When you can get out of your mind that you have to do things and get into what am I choosing to do with my life and get yeah. back into agency, that's where so much power is. But so many yeah. people feel forced to do things because, well, I have a car, so I have to pay, pay my bills. I have, you don't have to have a car. Nobody said you had to have a car. You choose to have a car. Well, if I didn't have a car, then I wouldn't be able to go. Well, you don't have to go anywhere. Guess what? The government will take care of you. Churches will take, like, you, you don't have to have a house. You can live on the street. You know, like there's, there's all these things that people feel like they have to have because it's expectations of others. And when you get to the point of, well, I'm choosing to have a car. I'm choosing to have this car payment. Wonderful. Then stop resenting the car payment. <laughs> You're making a choice to have it. Be happy that you made the choice. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it, it's kind of an interesting um uh let's see if I can find this. Sorry, you can go for it. So yeah, yeah. I, I wanna touch on that. So you mentioned agency. So I I touch in the book there's eight laws of of that are involved in Entrethrive that help entrepreneurs with their well being. The last law, which I call the kind of the keystone law, is entre agency. And in positive psychology, and, and Marty's been doing, Martin Sullivan's been doing a lot of, um, those who go through the program, we know him as Marty, right? And mm -hmm. uh, he uh, he's really been um, fascinated by agency and the power of agency when it comes to well-being and choices. We have the, these choices, unique choices. And there's three pillars that he has really identified in agency. And the first pillar is what we call in positive psychology is self-efficacy, which is really the belief that we can figure it out, that we can that, that we have the ability to, to do the hard things. Like when I had um, my, uh, the company was Home Care Pulse, and uh, it was a data analytics, kind of like JD Power for home care. And I was tasked by the trade association, only had been in business for a year, they wanted me to do a benchmarking study, didn't know stats, didn't know a lot of the things that required for that, but fortunately I had the self-efficacy knowing that I could, I could find people or do whatever to figure it out. That's the first pillar of agency. The second pillar of agency is optimism. An optimist, this is the difference between an optimist and a pessimist, is an optimist looks at every challenge that they face as temporary. Like this is, we'll get over this, it's temporary, like Viktor Frankl's that just, you know, mm -hmm. what he came overcame, optimist, right? Um, I love his quote, his life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose, right? That's Viktor Frankl, so he's the optimist. And then the third pillar is imagination, which completely ties to an entrepreneurial journey, like we have to have our imagination. And Marty studied like in history times when people lacked agency versus when they had agency and when those three things were taken away from the people then their agency was also their ability to act freely was taken away and so as entrepreneurs always asking ourselves do i believe in myself do i have the self-efficacy to figure this out do i really believe i can figure this out and how optimistic am i now, there's the thing called over-optimism people are trying to study right now because that can happen as well. We have to keep that in check. But that's really important. And then and then, how often am, do I have the space, you mentioned early, early on, the space to create? You know, for me, it's like, that's what money does for me is that is that it creates space for me to create like the role money plays in my life is that that if as long as i have enough to give me the space to create and i'm not stressed out about you know obligation right and you mentioned that as well i'm just kind of pulling apart all the things that you yeah. kind of mentioned here is that is that when we're feeling obligated to do things 
that we have to make certain choices based upon whatever outside influencers, um, other people in our life, the naysayers in our life, and so forth. When we're feeling obligated, our well-being suffers in that because that obligation does rob us of our own agency. Yeah, you know, and it's not free will at that point. Well, and it's it's interesting because one of the things you mentioned is in that I'm a super nerd as far as uh, I really like words. I think words people miss use words because they didn't learn English or they didn't read a dictionary. They use words based on how everybody else uses words and they kind of just morph the meaning. Oh, I guess this kind of word fits there because I'm so illiterate. I can't use another word that I'm going to use this word. And I'm the first one to be that person, right? Especially because I struggle with spelling. I'm going to use the shortest, easiest word rather than the longest word that actually is the right word. Okay. Like I'm not, so I'm not slamming anybody who feels that way. I'm that person too. And that doesn't, uh, I think that's one of the best things that I've ever done is re- when I'm reading is actually look up the definitions rather than like, okay, I kind of understand what that word means in context. But what does that word actually mean? Like you might think keep is just a normal word. Well, read it. How about read the origin of it? Read the origin of um, obey. Like th- those things are short words that you might use, but mis- uh, misuse often. So one of the things that you said just barely that again, I want to highlight um, and I, I'm confident you'll agree with me, but again, it's a form of, of language that sometimes we use to communicate to people something, even though they're inaccurate words to use. And, and this, I believe kind of what you're saying is at what point do we have to take ownership of this? And part of ownership is the vocabulary that we use. If we use uh, vocabulary of victim vocabulary, then it's hard to ever take ownership of that. I, interviewed a, uh, a part of the agency, right? w- woman on my podcast and she did um, uh, linguistic anthropology. So she, they, her master's degree was going into different areas in the world and different uh, demographics inside of cities and figure out who has the words to actually succeed and who has the words to fail in society. And a lot of the ghetto and the, the po- poverty, they actually don't even know the vocabulary of success. They, so they can't win, not because yeah. they're stuck there. Yeah. They're stuck there because they don't have the right vocabulary. So I'm going to highlight a word Successful here. Also, people have a common language, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so this is a problem. So th- this is why I'm going to highlight what you said, because I want to draw attention to it for the listener. Okay. So we're talking about agency, self-efficacy, optimism, imagination. Great. Well, something you said is what uh, I forget, Marty, right? But he studied mm-hmm. was when those were taken from the people then that's when people suffer. So here's the question, right? Who is allowed, well, not even who, maybe that's the wrong question. How can somebody take self-efficacy from you? Or what really happens is you surrender or you give up your self-efficacy. Nobody can take your mind from you. You can not direct your mind. But if you believe that somebody, if you're using language that somebody could take this from you or they were taken or they were removed from society, there's a lot of programming that happens. But if you don't recognize that the programming is happening and you're just are a victim, oh, it's taken from me, then that's outside of the realm of positive psychology. So agency is something that only you can give up. And it's also something that only you can take back. Mm -hmm. That's that's Mm -hmm. the crazy thing is, it's when yeah. we say it's taken, it's not taken, it's surrendered. And yeah. as soon as you decide to employ agency in your life, it'll be there. As that's long good. as you choose to leave agency alone, then it won't be there. But that's a you choice. That's not yeah. anybody else's choice. Yeah. And Viktor Frankl is a perfect example of that. He's in a freaking yeah. war camp, being having all of his friends gassed, really. He, like, he epitomizes someone who had the right mindset, right? that he right. chose regardless of circumstance he chose it now I, I i do believe like if you look in history like uh uh you know saint augustine for example and the way he looked at free will and agency and how he felt like people weren't capable of making their own choices that 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 everyone was fallen right and that they mm-hmm. um you know and even marty talks about this is that is that there are, I believe, circumstances that make it more challenging to exercise our agency, such as Viktor Frankl. But Viktor is one of those, and that's why I love his story, is that he 
he figured out how to thrive, you know, or at least get beyond his circumstances, you know, in his mind. And I call it in the book, I call it the good life mindset is that, is that the good life is in here, not out here. And I don't want people to misunderstand that when I say that good life is an entrepreneur, it's not about, um, external visual eye candy, like nice house, nice cars, all of that. That's, those are all, those are all fleeting things when it comes to the good life. The good life is about mindset and asking the right question. Like, for example, I would imagine that Victor Frankel, when he was in that war camp, that he was consistently questioning his thoughts Mm -hmm. and his, and, and, what happened yesterday? He was reframing, reframing every day as a learning opportunity or something that he had to kind of um, reframe as an experience that would help propel him into a better and brighter future. You know, Dr. Benjamin Hardy talks about that, right? In mm-hmm. his Yourself book is that his, I think that's his newest book. It's his but second it's, uh, newest book. His newest book second, is uh, 10x is easier than 2x. Yeah which is but, one of my favorite. Dan Sullivan is his co-author is my coach. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't love Dan. I've, I've known him for quite a while. I think but, that, yeah. I mean, that's 10 X is easier than two X. Dan Sullivan's name is still first on that, which I, I don't, well, he talks about that in another podcast, but I think it be your future self is um, Benjamin Hardy's most recent personal book. That's just by him. Yeah. So, so yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, big fan of both of them. Funny story but, about uh, him, really quick. We, uh, yeah, I was so I've read. My, I first was introduced to him with "Willpower Doesn't Work." That was mm-hmm. the first book I read of Benjamin Hardy's, and then it was like probably one of my favorite books for three or four years. It was a, like it's a good book, yeah, and uh, a good book. and then I started my podcast after that, and that was one of the first books I reviewed on my podcast. But I was like, man, it would be so cool to meet this author, you know. Well, then about two years later, I get an email from his staff saying, hey, Benjamin has coming out with a, a new book called Personality Isn't Permanent. Would love to have you, would love to have you interview him on your podcast. And I was like, no way. I get to meet my, like, oh, fun. kind of my idol person, you know, whatever. Like, not idol, but I really respect him. I love his, the way he thinks and breaks down stuff. And so got to interview him on my podcast. And then like two years later, my family were out in Florida at Disneyland and decided to, oh, are you still with me? Oh, man, I gotta love this. Whose internet is it? Are you back? Yeah, I'm not sure if my internet was still strong. (laughs) No, it's all good. I don't know what happened. So anyways, we're we're in uh, Florida at Disneyland with our family. We're sitting in church. I kid you not. He walks in and I'm just like, that's Benjamin Hardy. Yeah. Anyways, so uh, that's crazy. So I went up to him after. Yeah, yeah. He's been an impact on me as well. On on my podcast, he so he actually gave me one of his. Uh, your it was just like right after it launched the. Uh, what's it called? It's just be your future self. I think be your future self yeah. now. So he gave me a copy there, and I was like, that's so cool. Anyways, it was just cool that he went from, uh, you know, the just progression of our quote unquote relationship has been fun. Um, I, I love it. I love it. You know, you're welcome to introduce me to him. I, you know, Dan should probably introduce me. I was going to say, you guys yeah, have like I the know. same coach. I'm surprised <laughs> you guys don't know each other already. Yeah. So they, yeah, they're, they're not going to be writing any more books together. They've uh, kind of right. separated, but I, I need to reach out to Ben. We have so much in common, the two of us in our background. He's Ben's a, a organizational psychologist mm-hmm. and I'm a, positive psychologist and 
I feel like they both really religious background as well. So yeah, I feel like they both really uh, bridge. I mean, same with neuropsychology, right? It's all kind of the same thing, maybe with a slightly different outcome. Um, But a lot of it is how, and this kind of gets even to the conversation today, how do we structure our lives and ask ourselves the right questions so we can accomplish it? Like it's 10 X is easier than two X is really about that. Like, okay. So you think you're asking your questions, how to grow a little bit, how to grow more. And so with your entre thought thrive, what are, you mentioned you have about eight principles there. What are those principles that you feel like are, or eight laws, habits, practices that really help anybody starting out? I don't want to say avoid the grind because there's a, the grind is potentially mentally, but it is also like, you got to do the work, right? There's no, no, free meal for any entrepreneur. So saying, oh, well, you're going to avoid the grind. I don't know if I would agree with that unless we're defining the grind as a mentality. And then I'm, okay, we can avoid the grind. But what are those eight steps to really help those beginning entrepreneurs make it easier, not just on them, but something else you mentioned was on your family and the suffering of your personal life, which is not just you personally, but also your your wife, your children. So how do they make that a, a smoother transition? Yeah, yeah. So I'll go through through all eight really quick as and and kind of um, share maybe even a couple examples along the way that I have found through my own journey that by by implementing these eight laws, their mindset changes. Like it's all to me, it's like so much involved in our heads. And so the first law is, and I use entre uh, because intentionally because this is about entrepreneurs. This book's about entrepreneurs, and it's entre clarity is the first law. And to me, that's the cornerstone law. Entre agency is the keystone. Like if you you know you look at the arc, you know it's the keystone. But the cornerstone law is the entre clarity law. And the first part of entre clarity is getting clear on what I call your guiding truths. Like what do you want to be true about yourself? I, I have had my guiding truths for years. And in those moments, like I remember sleeping on my desk, trying to hit a deadline and um, exhausted, right? And seeing my guiding truths that help lighten that fire again. And there's other moments in my life where I've come back to my guiding truths to remind me what I want. One guiding truth is my mind is at peace. My actions reflect character. My body is in good health. My family receives my time, you know, all these things. My heart belongs to Christ. I'm a Christian. And so these things are all really important to me as I go through this journey. And so that law, entre clarity, is is like really getting clear on, we say get clear on your why. It goes beyond that, I believe, is that, is that, what what is what is true about you or your future self as you know um, Benjamin Hardy would say is what do you want to be true in the future about yourself and so those have been my kind of like guiding you know lighthouse you know for lack of a better term that I've kind of followed in those moments of uncertainty especially early on in my ventures that I that I've started I've, I've come back to those many times even when writing this book. I've had to remind myself of what's truly important. My life is filled with abundance is another guiding mm-hmm. truth. And so I I have to make sure I'm coming back to those. And then the second element of the entre clarity is what we call breakaways. In the book, I call them breakaways. And again, in cycling, as you can mm-hmm. see, big into biking. In the Tour de France, a breakaway is when you, you distance yourself from from basically the pack, right? And and breakaways are best done with the right people around you. And and that's really important. So what are your breakaways to get you to kind of live out your guiding truths? They're they're intertwined. Like we have to have these breakaways in life and to get clear on those breakaways. Second law, so once we're clear on that, the second law, and I've talked about this already, is this creation, is entre create is that when an entrepreneur is not not making the space to create, this, and creation is solving problems, um, coming up with your 20 ideas to get to the two or three good ideas or great ideas, right? You have to have that space to do it. We're happiest when we're creating. Mm-hmm. And so I have these deep thrive sessions that are my creative sessions every week, two or three hours where I'm just going deep into this creative space. Not every day, once or twice a week, that I really 
make that time to create. And it's often not even business related. Like right. for me, I have to pursue other passions outside of work to keep my personal flourishing site growing. So that creative space is important. Third law is, is, is what we call entre uh, grit. Angela Duckworth in her book, Grit, she's also a positive psychologist, is that we have to have as entrepreneurs, we have to have that grit. And there's five levels of on, on the professional side when we're pursuing something that can deepen our grit. The first level is curiosity. Like when we're thinking about starting a business, we has to start with curiosity, right? We have to be curious, not just doing it out of obligation. <laughs> Hopefully we never start a business that way, although some are guilty of that. Or I want to start selling something on Amazon when they're not, the curiosity isn't necessarily there. So curiosity, interest, interest is when we're doing the research, gaining the knowledge in the space. Then we go in, we start the company, and that the third phase is practice is that we're practicing, we're really learning everything. It's a 10,000 shots, right, in, in getting that practice. And then if we practice enough, then the passion, it turns into passion. Too often, especially younger entrepreneurs I'm finding, like to skip, try to think, try to get that passion sooner without the real practice. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's false passion sometimes, you know, that they, they think they're passionate about it, well, but they're not I think quite that that's, there. I think that that's huge because a lot of people, they, they are, they actually want to start their career or their path to success in a passionate place before they are curious, interested enough to actually learn something about it and be interested. They're like, well, I'm passionate about it as I am. So that should be enough. Almost yeah. never. The most, pa like, it's like, Practice beats talent every day of the week, all day long, always. Now, when talent practices, wonderful. But if yeah. you're just a talented person, you will cap. And as soon as it gets hard, you lose. And this is why it's entre grit, probably. But you lose your ability to stick it out because it's like, well, that was hard. It was. It, it's fun until I'm passionate about it until it's hard. Then I'm not passionate about it anymore. Then right. I'm not and interested that's not about true it. Passion, right? It's not true that's passion. Not but people think, well, I should be passionate about what I do for work. Most people do what they do for work and then they become passionate about it. That's another law in Judaism where do you keep the commandments because you want to or do you keep the commandments and then figure out why you're keeping the commandments? Like, do you have to understand why you keep a commandment before you keep the commandment? Or should you keep the commandments and as you're obeying, as you're becoming like God, then you learn why you're becoming like God. Yeah. You learn, you understand why he asked yeah. you to do that. Oh, I love that. Right? So it's like, yeah. what is Definitely. the goal of the process? And people want, they're, they're flipping it on the head, right? They're saying, oh, I should be passionate and then everything's going to be easy. Trying to find something you're passionate about happens through first finding, just like you said, curiosity, then getting interested enough that you're going to study it or learn something about it, and then practicing the hell out of it because if you don't practice, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And so many yeah, people yeah. are doing it backwards. So I love I try that. to skip the practice part. It's, yeah. it's really crazy. And passion really, when it comes to grit, it really gets us pretty far as entrepreneurs. Sure. But then there's that fifth level. And the fifth level, it ties to, uh, in the 10X book, um, this, the concept that Dan's been teaching us for years in my, in my coaching is the unique ability. But I call it in the book calling, like when, when we feel called, right? And this is a God thing as well sometimes mm -hmm. is that we, we feel called. Um, we are going to, our, our ability to, 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 to persist and to keep going is amplified, mm -hmm. you know, especially when we feel called and it's our unique ability. Like, for example, getting into positive psychology and now feeling called to help entrepreneurs thrive and find well-being followed these five phases to a T. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. My practice part was, was I went all in financially, time. Like, I never knew at 49 I would be going back and getting a master's degree from an Ivy League school. The fact that I was even accepted was it blew my mind, right? But I was a B student in, in, in my undergrad, and that I, you know, through that evolution and that practice, like really intense practice, 25, 30 hours, additional hours a week while I was running my business. 
businesses, um, that was intense. That's practice. It led me to my passion. It's not like I was passionate about positive psychology when I finished reading this book by you Sean Aikman. Exposed Aikel, to right? it, and you're like, yeah, That's I was exposed. My concept. curiosity, right here. Yeah. This is my curiosity phase. Anyway, that's I talked about that with Britt, and then I also talked about the dangers of that is that our calling can become obsessive. And in positive psychology, we talk about obsessive passion versus harmonious passion. Harmonious passion is when we have we pursue other passions outside of work that help us balance our and again, balance is I think overused. We can never sure. balance we don't have balance, but we have present, like to be present with those that we love and 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 not to be completely one-sided in the professional side. Uh, again, the lie of the either or is we feel like we can only do one or the other. Um, but anyway, that's that's grit. The the fourth one is super important. This book, uh, let's see here, where is that book? Oh, it's right here. The Good Life, right? And and the number one impact or factor to well-being is our relationships so i call it entre connections the fourth law but and, and there's three levels of, of 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 what i talk about in that in that law is that when it comes to our relationships i don't talk about a lot about the types of relationships there's a lot of books on that i really talk about the first thing is the first phase, the crawl part of relationships is, are you congruent with who you say you are in your relationships? You know, are you the same person in private as you are in public? You know, in that sense, that congruency, I think gets overlooked when it comes to relationships. It's hard to have deep relationships when that's off, when the congruency is off. You know, living, living accordingly to who we say we are on social media, you know, being congruent with that. When we're congruent, we can also, the second one, the walk part is, uh, you know, Martin Luther King's great quote, um, you know, if you can't fly, then then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. I use that a lot in the book, that kind of frame each law. And so the, the um, walk part is being present and you know, like there's no such thing as, as personal and professional perfect balance. But when you are in with your relationships, you're all in. Like, let's say for I just started a company. And when you just start a company, you have to put in the time. I mean, I get that. But when you're home, be home. When you're and I don't live this perfectly. I still no, work this still. out right. You know, there's I'm, a, I'm a distracted in, entrepreneur. In so. the greatest salesman in the world, he and I think it's scroll marked um, four or five, but he says um, you have to divorce yourself from their business when you're at home and you have to divorce yourself from your family um, when you're at work. And so some of the people that I've mentored, they're like, that sounds terrible. Why would I want to program myself to be divorced at work? That sounds, and again, they're using the word divorced purely in a relationship marriage standpoint, but it's like divorcing yourself is basically saying, look, that is not my focus. This is my focus. Now, if there's an emergency, sure, you're going to do what you need to do, but the focus needs to be, are you all into what you're doing when you're doing it? Are you focused on your yeah. children when you're with your children or are you halfway yeah. in work and halfway at family? And then at that point, yeah, you're not in any Too often. Yeah. I love that. Um, too often we treat our lives, especially as entrepreneurs, like a, a typical doctor's office, you know, where we go in, where we don't, we, we, we treat those relationships where we're just giving a, 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 a diag, you know, diagnostic and, you know, we're just kind of like, here's your, here's the prognosis or, or here's, you know, here's what, here's the recommendation and what you need to, to improve and pawn in 15 minutes we're in and out and onto the next thing and not really being present um, in that, in that moment with our most important relationships. And so, and then, and then, then the last part of that, that law is with entre connections is what we call high quality connections. This is a term coined by Jane, the psychologist, organizational psychologist from the university of Michigan, Michigan. She coined it as high quality connections and whatever we're doing 
we have to be, you know, this engagement and making sure that we are well connected, whether it's with your Uber driver. And I have an example in the book. I talk about an experience where I had an Uber driver give me a hug after we he dropped me off. We had just a high quality connection, you know, and and so wherever we are, just having that. I had a partner who was really good at just sitting down and being present with our team members. Even we we owned a call center. Um, in, in one of my businesses and these were college kids and their lives are you know, trying to figure things out and he would take a real interest in their lives and from a hierarchy in the business they were down you know from the, the organizational chart or the accountability right. chart with their way down here but you would have thought that they were equals right he treated right. them that way and those high quality connections are they they help our well-being and the well-being of those that we're connected with it's so important for these entrepreneurs to really grab hold of that and i think that's part of a legacy right mm -hmm. you talk about legacy to be known of being someone who was present wow what what better legacy is that to me and that's kind of what i want my kids and grandkids and great grandkids to to know me uh, right. So start thinking then, about that. We're, we're yeah. out of time, unfortunately. So if you yeah. want the other four, you got to have to. Yeah, that's right. Book. There you go. Uh, hey, that that's was not book. planned, guys. I promise you. I want to yeah. know the other four as much as you do. Yeah. But yeah. it is awesome. what it is. So we can have them come back, which is always a pleasure for me. I love having people come back on the show and finish conversations. Yeah, we love that. Um, we love what that. I would love to do is if I can get your book before then. And then I can read yeah. it and have an even better conversation. I'd love to share the manuscript with you. Sam. Yeah, I'll, yeah, please I'll, I'll do. Send that over to you. Yeah. Um, but where could they go? Where Where is going to be the best place for them to either pre-order your book or get your book uh, when it comes out? Not on Amazon. I'm I'm an Amazon hater for most of the time. I like I like Amazon <laughs> a lot, but man, they do not give you your the authors do when. When they're selling yeah, books. I agree with that. So yeah, so entrethrive.com, E-N-T-R-E, -E, just like entrepreneur, entrethrive.com. And then we actually created a special link for your listeners. So you can go to entrethrive.com forward slash fuel your legacy. And they can download an entre clarity guide. And it talks about those two things we already talked about, the the guiding truths and the breakaway. We have tools, two tools in there that your listeners can listen to. They can also click the link to order the there's a link to order the pre-order the book. They can actually pre-order um, you know, the Kindle or whatever, you know, the hard, co hard sure. cover copy and so forth. So from there. And then engage in some of our content. Yeah, I I'm gonna I don't know why I feel inspired to say this right now, but Somebody's going to listen to this and that's you, whoever you are, listen to this and pay attention. When you're going to these people's websites, one, I know you have a book in you and you need to share the book. When you write a book, don't just write a book. Go and study his site. I haven't even been on his site, but I feel like I'm, you're supposed to say this right now. Go study his site because the book is one element to a successful transference of information. As he said, the book was the curiosity phase of grit. But how are you going to get interested? There's other resources. So when you're thinking, I'm going to write a book, the book is one of probably 10 other ways to reuse the same content to the benefit. So you're actually transferring the information. You're not just writing a book for the sake of writing a book, but hopefully you're writing a book because you actually want to create an impact. You want to leave a legacy. And to do that in the world we're in today, it's not just that it's easy, but it is significantly easier to repurpose this content, make it more digestible for many different fashions, and then create guides and ways for the people who are reading the book, who are curious and now want to implement, give them a way to implement, implement it. So go study his website from it. If I was to go write my own book, how could I mirror what Aaron's done? Aaron, I don't know how much he paid for his yeah. author, sorry, his, uh, his uh, team to do it, right? But yeah, yeah a little pay. investment. Yeah, people pay tens of thousands of dollars and that's not a bad thing. And I'm not, again, I don't know what you paid or how much you got paid to, to write the book. Doesn't matter. Point is, people pay for this information and you can go learn from what they did. Do you know all of the direct information? No. But if you set out with your objective, again, this goes back to entre clarity. If you set out with the end goal in mind and you're clear about what that's going to look like, what type of courses, what type of guides, what type of, I mean, he reframed. Yes, he's pulled stuff from other people, but he's creating his own 
Uh, we I call them cult phrases, which is not a bad thing, but they're his own phrases. He's repackaging age old information in a way that makes sense for him. And why is that important? You're like, well, if we're all regurgitating the same information, why does it matter? Because there's 8 billion people on this planet. That's why it matters. And there's a small group of them, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 people who see the world almost identically as you do. And so yeah. when you yeah. choose to share your vision of the world, you're going to find your people, your tribe. And when you find your tribe, you're able to make a bigger impact. And that's what it's about. It's about creating that multi-generational. So don't be afraid to rip off and duplicate. That's what they call R&D, okay? Rip off and duplicate other people. Now, it doesn't mean copy and paste and plagiarize. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying mm -hmm. look and learn from other people's success and learn how you can pr plan and implement it and then make it unique to you, which he also talked yeah, about. Yeah, and tell your story. Like That's the power of my book too, is that no one has my story, right? That's my story. Yeah, And you exactly. share it and you apply it to the principles, it's powerful. Right for people to read, like they'll never get that out of Chat GPT, right? There's, no, no, that's my story. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And so, anyways, just go to his website, entrethrive.com, and then if you want to use the the forward, forwarding link to the one that he set up specifically for me, it's going to be in the chat notes here. But we want to help you get this and implement it. We don't do these things just for fun, although they are fun. We love what we do. But I, I do the podcast so I can help people level up their game. That's why I do the podcast. <laughs> okay. So I want to help you with that. Thank you so much, Aaron, for taking the time to be with us today. Total fun. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy Show. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.